Hadir. Welcome, Mbak Yuyun. Terima kasih. Saya mohon izin untuk memasukkan semua peserta. Oke. Okay. Silakan.
Hello, welcome everyone. So we're still waiting for uh, the host to admit everyone in the waiting room. We'll, we'll begin shortly. Okay, so welcome. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the national webinar. Welcome to the National Webinar Alert in Digital Attacks and Cyber Resilience within the Civil Society and Media in Indonesia. This webinar is organized by the Southeast Asia Freedom of Expression Network, or SafeNet, the Asian Forum for Human Rights and Development, or Forum Asia, the Indonesia Cyber Security Forum, ICSF, Amnesty International Indonesia, and Indonesia Anti-Hope Society, or MAFINDO. My name is Rifda Amalia from Amnesty International Indonesia, and I will be your MC for tonight. So before we begin, I would like to announce some house rules for today's session. First, for participants, please kindly mute or turn off your microphone. And second, we recommend you to turn on your camera, if possible. Third, type your questions in the chat boxes of Zoom or YouTube with this format. First, your name and organization, then to whom your question is addressed, and finally, your question. Then later, the, organiz the organizer will collect the questions and hand them over to the moderator for her to read. I would also want to remind everyone that tonight's webinar will be recorded for documentation and we will host this webinar full in English. First, um, I would like to welcome the seventh Deputy Assistant for Communication, Information and Apparatus Coordination of the Coordinating Ministry for Political, Legal and Security Affairs of Indonesia, Kemenko Polhukam, Marsma Dr. Sigit Priyono. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight, Pa. Also, 
Thank you for everyone who have registered to attend tonight's webinar. Welcome, thank you. Now I would like to uh, go through our tonight's schedule just very quickly. First, we're going to hear an opening remarks from one of the organizers and then it will be followed by the session. The moderator will then take over for the next 60 minutes. We're going to hear the presentation from each speakers later on around 7.30 p.m. Jakarta time. If, if we still have the time, we're going to open a Q&A session. And as I said before, you can type your questions throughout the entire evening in the chat box and type your name and organization and to whom your question is addressed and the question. And then after the closing, we're going to hand certificates to our speakers, but please after that, do not log out just yet because we're going to have a photo session together at the end of this event. Without further ado, um, I would like to introduce, um, I want us to say hi and welcome Mr. Ardi Suteja as one of the representative of the organizer. I would like to um, introduce Mr. Ardi Suteja. Mr. Ardi is a chairman and founder of Indonesia Cyber Security Forum or ICSF. ICSF is a nonprofit multi-stakeholder cyber security clearinghouse. Sorry for the interruption. I will repeat, ICSF is a nonprofit multi-stakeholder cybersecurity clearinghouse. Aside from ICSF, RD is the president director of Indonesia Dirgantara Expo or IDEX, an event organizer management company focusing on ICT, aviation, and maritime events. RD is also a former board of trustees and senior advisors of Indonesia's ICT community or MASTEL. ICSF, together with SafeNet, Forum Asia, Amnesty International Indonesia, and Mafindo, have organized today's webinar. Mr. Suteja, the mic is yours to, live, to deliver the opening remarks. Hi, Mas Adi. Okay, makasih. Uh, selamat datang uh, untuk teman-teman yang mengikuti acara pada malam ini. Uh, Saya ingin menghormati tamu kita dari luar, izinkan saya mungkin uh, menyampaikan uh, welcome remark saya dalam bahasa Inggris. Uh, I would like to address uh, my, my welcome remarks this evening in English. And um, as I was introduced earlier, uh, my name is Ardi Suteja. I'd like to welcome all of you to this, uh, this evening's webinar, jointly hosted by SafeNet, uh, Forum Asia, ICSF, Amnesty International, Indonesia, and Mafindo. We are very excited to host this webinar and partnering with some of the renowned and globally acclaimed speakers. I think I'm talking uh, talking uh, to Melissa, who are here uh, far away from uh, the US. And uh, we are actually uh, going to discuss a lot of important issues this evening with regards to, to the safety and security, as well as freedom of speech in the cyberspace. These issues has increased during the past few years and to a certain degree, it has also disrupt expectation what cyberspace is all about. Safety and security in, in the cyberspace itself is becoming fo a focus issue domestically, as well as internationally, ranging from breach of netiquettes to more sophisticated high-tech crimes, and of course, limitation on the use of cyberspace for expressing public opinions. As cyberspace is a huge uncharted uh, frontier, we cannot discuss and cover all aspects in one evening, but it is very important for all of us to understand the issues, not only as the users of the service space, but also as to the government regulators, business communities, academia, and others in finding ways to resolve conflicts and issues on the cyberspace together as part of the monthly stakeholder approach. As cyberspace is a shared resources, we cannot afford in having any disruption to our means of connectivity due to the lack of mutual understanding among the multi-stakeholder. Having said that, let's have a fruitful and constructive discussion this evening so that we all can learn from one another to understand and resolve any issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mas. Thank you for the opening remarks. And now I'm going to introduce our moderator for tonight, Ms. Anita Wahid. 
Ms. Anita Wahid is a human rights and democracy activist, mainly on three issues, anti-corruption, religious tolerance, and information disorders. For the past five years, she focuses on how information disorders such as misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation have been a major challenge in Indonesia, which contributes to the already challenging issues of religious intolerance, anti-corruption, human rights, and democracy. She now serves as the Presidium of Masyarakat Anti-Fitnah Indonesia, or MAFINDO, a volunteer-based organization that works on information disorders. Now, uh, please, Ms. Anita Wahid, the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Rifda, for the kind introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Anita Wahid, and I'll be moderating this discussion session on the alert in digital attacks and cyber resilience within CSO and media in Indonesia. First, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished panelists and, of course, to all participants who I'm sure are very eager to listen and participate in, this, in the discussion. Um, just for a brief uh, uh, um, context giving, um, I just want to make it very, very brief so that, so that I don't reveal too much of the discussion. Um, well, as we know that now that we have uh, this digital technology growth and social media has become a new battlefield for various contestations, we've been seeing for the past few years a growing number of cyber attacks happening around us and they came in different forms like cyber bullying or trolling or doxing or save, uh, or smear campaigns or uh, any any battle that we saw in uh, in social media platforms but we're also seeing forms uh, different forms that that, uh, that are very dangerous and very uh, surprising and uh, taken us uh, taking us aback, like WhatsApp and social media accounts hijacking, for instance, or website defacing and others. And these attacks uh, somehow attack individuals like activists or academicians or journalists, as well as attacking institutions like media or NGOs that are pushing certain issues. And we've seen that most of these attacks are related to controversial and highly debated public policies with what seems to be the intention is to silence opposing views. And with regard to this problem, the temptation right now is to go deep into looking on who's behind these attacks, who are attacking us, who are attacking the journalists, the activists, the academicians. But that conversation, even though it will be very indulging for a lot of us, will divert us into uh, will divert us from actually a more pressing and urgent matter to, to be addressed, such as how well aware are we on these attacks? Does the public know about this? And how does the public respond to this? And how vulnerable are we to these kind of attacks? And are we alone in this problem? And uh, from from uh, that background. Uh, we need to discuss more into what measures do we need to take for our own cybersecurity and what can be done individually and collectively to build our uh, cyber resilience. So for the purpose of discussing these matters, uh, today we have uh, with us six distinguished panelists. First, we have Shirley Haristia from Freedom on the Net, which just released uh, the Freedom on the Net Index of 2020 a couple of days ago. Shirley earned her PhD in Communication Studies at the Wee Kim Wee School of Communication and Information, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Shirley, welcome and thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you. And our second panelist is Ravio Patra. Rafio is a public uh, policy researcher who currently works with Westminster Foundation for Democracy. It is a UK public uh, body advancing democratic legislation process with parliaments in over 30 countries. And Ravio also conducts research for the Open Government Partnership. And among others, Ravio has contributed to reports on issues such as uh, data governance, political party financing, extractive industry, transparency, and healthcare in Indonesia, Mongolia, and Afghanistan. And most of us maybe know him as one of the victims of these uh, cyber attacks that had that's been happening uh, 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 in the past few years. Ravio, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you as well for having me. And we also have with us Sabto Anggoro, a founding member of Indonesian Internet Name Domain Management or PANDI and former Secretary General of Indonesian Internet Service Provider Association or ABGI. And Sabto started his journalistic career at the Surabaya Post, Harian Buana, and Republika before joining the TICOM in 1999. In 2011, he founded Merdeka.com in collaboration with uh, Kapan Lagi Network. 
And in 2016, he also founded the news portal Tirto.id, where he is now the editor in chief. As well, uh, uh, we know uh, we know that Tirto is one of the medias that's been attacked by uh, by these um, cyber uh, well cyber attacks. Sapto, are you here with us? Welcome. Yes, I'm here. Welcome. Thank you, Anit. And then we have our fourth panelist, Ms. Yuyun Wahyuningrum. She right now serves as the representative of Indonesia to the Asian Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, uh, or AHR, until 2021. And she has spent more than 22 years working in human rights organizations at the national, regional, and international levels, which include Human Rights Working Group based in Jakarta, Forum Asia in Bangkok, Oxfam, Child Workers in Asia, and the Solidarity Center, and the National Community, uh, the National Commission on, Ch on Child Protection. Welcome, Yuyun. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Our fifth panelist is Melissa Halloway. She's a leading expert in cyber security. She served in two U.S. presidential administrations, and she's spearheading uh, the Cyberspace Policy Review for President Barack Obama and also leading the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative for, Pres for President George W. Bush. And Melissa built a broad coalition from within the executive branch and established an unprecedented partnership with Congress to obtain bipartisan support for addressing cybersecurity priorities. Melissa, we are so lucky to have you here with us. Welcome. Good evening, Anita. It's so great to be here with you all. And our last but not least, uh, Pat list is Herlambang Wiratraman. He is a lecturer at, Con uh, at Constitutional Law Department and researcher at the Center of Human Rights Law Studies, Faculty of Law, Erlanga University, which he had chaired uh, the center between 2015 until 2019. And his major research includes the subjects of uh, constitutional law, human rights, media, and freedom of expression. Herlambang also actively involved in uh, de defending human rights and academic freedom through various alliances and policy reform strategies. And currently he serves as steering committee of Southeast Asian Human Rights Studies Network and also serves as coordinator of Indonesian Caucus for Academic Freedom. And he's also an expert team member for developing norm and procedural standard for freedom of expression and opinion at the Indonesian National Human Rights Commission. All panel. Uh, Herlambang, thank you so much for being here with us. Are you here with us? Oh, he may not be here with us, but that's okay. We'll be, we'll, uh, yes. we'll be, oh, okay. Thank you so much for being here with us, Mas Herlambang. Okay, so all panelists, thank you so much for being here with us and to share your expertise with all of us participating in this webinar. I'm going to start um, with uh, this discussion by throwing a question to Shirley. Shirley, uh, can you share with us the latest report on Indonesia in freedom of, on the net, uh, which you have released uh, a couple of days ago, to give us the framework of where we are right now? Where is Indonesia standing and how is the situation in terms of the freedom within the scope of internet for Indonesia? And, uh, how's the trend? Is it looking good? Is it declining? Is it raising? So uh, to kick us off, Shirley, I'm going to give the floor to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Anita, for the opening. Good evening from Jakarta, everyone, uh, respected speakers and also audience. So uh, my name is Shirley Haristia. Uh, I would like to make a disclaimer first that I am here not to represent Freedom House and the Freedom on the Net report, but I am their in-country researcher. So I would like to present my ideas today uh, in my personal capacity. So this is my slide. Uh, could we move to the next slide? So I'm going to touch upon these three uh, issues. First, I would like to discuss about the definition of cybersecurity and cyber resilience. And then I would like to reveal the findings from the Freedom on the Net Report 2020, specifically on the Indonesia chapter. And the last point is I would like to uh, make, make us reflect and think what is the way forward for Indonesia. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, when I accepted this invitation to present on this event, actually I was thinking, so what is actually cyber resilience? 
And then I, I browse and browse through many uh, journal articles. Uh, so basically in, in my uh, brief uh, understanding is that actually now there is a movement, a shifting from cybersecurity to cyber resilience. That is cyber resilience is when uh, under this uh, particular COVID-19 pandemic, where everybody is now going online. So I think it is becoming a new normal for digital attacks, cyber attacks to happen more frequently. So cyber resilience is uh, when digital attacks are happening, systems, institutions, they are ready to get up and to serve the people, the business quickly. That is the understanding that I got from the definition of cyber resilience. But after browsing several many different journal articles, then I was struck by one paper, one report from the foundation named New America. So in 2014, they made this study. So it is about the compilation of existing cybersecurity and information security definitions. And the key finding of their report is that actually they found out there are 400 different related cybersecurity definitions, which are trying to be formed by different entities, whether they are coming at, from policy making uh, institutions or private companies, they are, they are uh, fighting each other to form this definition. But the key issue then is uh, they are trying to shift the focus, no, not, not shift, they are trying to shape the focus, whether on the system or on the human, what does it mean? So if the, the definition of cybersecurity is focusing on system, then these policy making institutions and private companies, they would like to pay more attention more on the protection and security of the system instead of the protection of human. Meanwhile, there are other organizations specifically uh, like civil society organizations working on internet related issues, they are trying to shift this uh, main narrative of cybersecurity definition by saying that, hey, no, it's not about the protection of the system, but cybersecurity is about the protection of human. And so what is, why is it important for us to speak about the definition of cybersecurity? Because if, the definition of cybersecurity is more focusing on the system than the medium or the means to do cybersecurity might be doing might be done through mitigation of risk for the system and to some extent it could uh, the, the related institutions they could take whether legitimate or illegitimate measures to protect the system for uh, at the expense of the protection of people and so um, but if we focus on the latter, that is the empowerment of people, then the approach, the measures will be different. Uh, I think the challenge and the key issue in here is how do we get these two key goals to primary goals? That is, we would like to protect the system, but also we would like for the sake of the protection of the people. But I've been wondering what about the, the trend in cyber resilience, the definition of cyber resilience, whether the same trend of trying to mold and shape the definition is still the same as the definition of cyber security. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I would like to go on to the findings from the Freedom on the Net report 2020. So, I have been writing for this report uh, since 2019. And for those who are not familiar yet with this report, so this is the report from the organization, the think tank named uh, Freedom House. So basically they compare the scores of online freedom in 65 different countries. And then they divided the scores into three different categories that are free, partly free and not free. And Indonesia uh, has been at the uh, middle score that is partly free. Uh, in 2019, Indonesia got the score of 51 out of 100. And in 2020, unfortunately, the score is declining to 49 out of 100. Next slide, please. 
Oh, before I forgot, uh, maybe uh, I need to explain a little bit deeper about uh, how this research is conducted. So basically, they try to evaluate and measures in three different categories. That is first, the obstacles to access, and second is limits on content, and third is violations on users' rights. And based on this, Chief rivals, and then they divide it into several further indicators. Next slide, please. There are actually several key findings from the report this year. First, uh, of course, uh, we know how about the internet restriction in Papua uh, by the government. And then also the second key finding is uh, actually Reuters revealed that there is a military operating website that is reporting pro-government content. And the third finding is about uh, criminal charges filed against journalists, activists, and ordinary members of the public. And the four key findings is intimidation and doxing towards uh, human rights activists for their online activity. And the last one, and, and this is the most relevant one for our discussion tonight, is that more activists reported having their social media accounts hacked and also uh, media outlets and some public and private institutions as well. And of course, these experiences will be then told by Rafi Opatra and Pak Saptoli uh, after my presentation. Uh, in, in this part, in this finding, uh, I took note of several cybersecurity attacks happening to not only individuals like Rafio Patra and uh, Dr. Panduriono, who criticized the way the government handles uh, COVID-19 in Indonesia, but I also uh, noticed about uh, cyber attacks happening to, like, for example, in 2017, uh, hospital named Harapan Kita, and also the website of KPK, the Commission, the Erad Com Corruption Eradication Commission, and also, uh, for example, uh, the, the, the data breach of Tokopedia and Lion, Lion Air. And next slide, please. So I think. Uh, from those cyber attacks and data breach happening to many individuals and institutions in Indonesia, of course, there are lots of behind stories of this, how, indiv how of how these individuals are suffering, like uh, Ravio and Pasato will tell us in, in, a little bit, in, a, in a little bit. And so I think it is wise for us to look at how this one study by uh, IP. So actually this book is about like uh, how we should form the research agenda of Indonesia because Indonesia will be celebrating its 100th birthday uh, in the next like uh, 20 more years from now. And this book is written by a group of leading professors in Indonesia. And there is one chapter of this book, the title of the chap that chapter is, I put it in this red box, that is how technology could shape, could mold humanity. Uh, by quoting this uh, quote from the book wrote by some leading scholars, Indonesian scholars. So I would like to pose a reflection question. How, uh, do Indone how does Indonesia want to shape its uh, cyber security or cyber policy, cyber cyber resilience policies. Do we want to put emphasis more on the system or do we want to put emphasis more on the society or the public? Thanks. Thank you, Shirley. And that was uh, an, a very intriguing question that you input, that, that, that you uh, pose us there. I and mean, we are in the face of really determining for ourselves what do we want actually. Do we want to really focus on the system? Do we want to focus on the human beings? Which one is more important? Which one can we really rely on? And which one will actually impact more 
uh, would have created more impact on the uh, on the future of the of democracy and the society. Thank you so much. I will go go back to you again um, after we all we listen to all the panelists. Um, Rafio, I'm going to uh, turn this to you right now. Can you turn on your mic? Yeah. yeah okay. So Ravio, uh, everyone knows that you are uh, one of the uh, victim of the cyber attacks, and when it happened, it created such a um, such a, such a turmoil because everyone was so surprised. It was in the middle. Uh, nothing was happening at that time. Uh, nothing major. Like there's no um, d big debate on on public policies that we were aware of. And suddenly you were you were hit. So can you share with us your experience on being a victim of cyber attack and what was uh, what was going on at that time? What went through your mind and what's your take on this phenomenon? Uh, you have ten minutes to uh, to share with us. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Banita. So I think I, I'd like to start with uh, the same thing that Shelley started with. I wanted to just put up a disclaimer here that uh, whatever I say here on this webinar is uh, my personal views, my personal thoughts, my personal opinions, not uh, those of my employers. And I think uh, the first thing that I would like to say is that I'm by no means the first ever victim of cyber attack, but I think uh, as Anita pointed out, what happened to me happened out of nowhere, uh, at least to the eye of the public. It seemed like, you know, nothing prompted it. So it kind of, I think it kind of took people by surprise. And then, you know, after what happened to me, it seems like we just went downhill from there. Like, you know, it started like um, af after what happened, after what happened to me, I think we had uh, multiple attacks on uh, university lecturers. We had attacks on students. We had attacks on uh, other activists uh, and et cetera. So I think, um, you know, it's just that the phenomenon was um, coming to the surface, but like I don't think it was by any means uh, the start of something new. Uh, what happened to me? Uh, but I, but I, what I would like to uh, focus here today is that uh, I think most people here, if not all, uh, are probably aware already of what happened uh, back in April. And I think uh, I haven't really spoken candidly about it, uh, about what ha what really happened. Uh, you know what what led to that night to that fateful night and i think what i can say is that um there are things that i you know i'm just not at liberty to say uh, and to go into details here but i what i can say is that uh there are multiple possibilities right like what one thing is that you know a lot of people believe that uh, it was because of my tweeting which i am not inclined to agree with because i think you know there's a lot of people who tweet you know more aggressively like i mean i i tweet pretty much just like any average person. Like, I mean, I tweet, you know, based on my research, I tweet data, I tweet numbers. So, you know, like sometimes there are personal stuff, but like that, nothing political in the sense that, you know, something that would get you in trouble, right? So like, I, I'm not really inclined to believe that it was because of my activity on social media. So what I, what I do believe is that, uh, you know, and this is something that I haven't really spoken um, publicly about, at least not in person, uh, is that, it had something to do with something I was working on um, in the background. So I mean, uh, of course, this is some uh, what 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 I what I was working on is not something that I have published yet uh, because at the time we were just starting to work on it. And the issue is a bit is you know I mean saying that it's a sensitive issue would be an understatement because it uh, involves a region that is conflict prone. It involves someone in the inside in the in the inner circle of the government. It involves someone. In the intelligence agencies, so you know, it's something that you know. I feel like if I say anything to you know, if I say too much details here, then you know, it'll just jeopardize my situation. But that's uh, what I can say, at least. Uh, what I believe is the reason um, for what happened to me back in April, because everything escalated pretty quickly. So basically, the night of uh, the twenty first, uh, April twenty first, uh, that night, I discovered several. Uh, documents that linked uh, someone in the inner circle, uh, a special aide of the president, uh, linked to a project, uh, you know, in a very sensitive area, which I know, which I think everyone is aware of what I'm referring to. Um, and the project involves uh, hundreds of billions of rupiah. Uh, there was no procurement uh, process for it. There was no public uh, bidding at all. Uh, and the whole the whole details of the project was just, uh, you know, it was just, just suspicious. So I was looking into that. 
And I was looking into that with uh, some friends from uh, civil society, with some friends from uh, anti-corruption watchdogs. Uh, and I think I uh, what what I rushed into was that I, I I tried to confront one of the people involved in the uh, in the in the case that I was investigating, uh, and this was something that I was doing on my own. Uh, as in, this was something I was doing pro bono, not something that was commissioned by my organization or my employers, just to make that clear. And I think like in a matter of hours after I confronted one of the people that were involved, uh, my phone was, you know, it, it just started dysfunctioning. So I, I basically told this story multiple times already to the media that uh, I woke up that day uh, around 2 p.m. Uh, I woke up that day to see my, to find my WhatsApp saying that uh, my phone number has been registered on another device. So I cannot use my WhatsApp on that phone anymore. Uh, and immediately my thought was just, you know, like, like there was never any, I, any thought in my head that, you know, this was something people was doing to me. Like that someone was doing this to me because they wanted to, you know, say, uh, steal my identity or like uh, probably jailbreak into my bank account. Like there was like, we, I didn't think about that at all. Like I, my thought immediately went to that, uh, this has something to do with what I was working on. Uh, for sure. So I contacted Damar from SafeNet. I contacted some journalist friends. I contacted uh, colleagues from several other places that I I knew could help. So you know, long story short, everyone knew uh, that night. In a matter, I think like in eight hours. Sorry, in six hours after I was I found out that my phone was hacked. Uh, I was taken into custody uh, by people not in uniform without. In any warrants at all. So I think uh, probably Yu Yun would want to respond to that because I think one of the key things that I have always believed all these years is that when you understand the law, at the very least, if you understand a little bit, or like probably not a little bit, like uh, if you understand enough of the law, then you can at least protect yourself from being abused by the law, right? Or, or by the law enforcement to be precise. But in reality, that didn't happen. I mean, I knew, I, I pretty much when 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 like a crazy person i recited the all the articles or the all the passage on uh the procedural code uh relating to how you are you are you are entitled to be given an, an arrest warrant uh you know a confiscation warrant a, uh, a search warrant etc uh that you were in, that you are entitled to be given legal counsel when you are interrogated by the police for example like i i recited the the the, the, the passage for in verbatim uh throughout the two nights i was there and you know like it didn't do anything. So I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that uh, at the end of the day, I don't think understanding the law uh, really helps you because at the end of the day, if the law enforcement isn't, you know, that don't, don't follow the law as it is written or as it is intended to, then there's really no need for you to understand the law. Uh, and I think uh, what I would want to go into next is that um, I think a lot of people mistake, um, you know, the government being, being vigilant about people uh, spreading hoaxes, for example, spreading misinformation, and people being critical, uh, like the government confused these two things uh, a lot of the time. Like for example, ever since I, you know, ever I was I was in police custody for I think 35 hours, and then ever since then I've I've spoken in multiple public appearances, and I think one of the things that I have definitely noticed from the government whenever I I encounter someone from the government speaking on the other side of the aisle is that the government tends to gaslight you. Like, like they, they keep telling me that, oh, you're not critical though. You're, you're just spreading disinformation. You're, you're spreading libels. You're defaming the government, et cetera. But like in reality, they don't have any proof that, you know, for example, I spread disinformation that I create, that I spread hoax, for example. So at the end of the day, the government keeps telling you that they're not cracking down on, the, on civil society. They're not cracking down on people voicing their opinions. They're just cracking down on people spreading disinformation. But like, uh, in reality, you don't really see this disinformation that the government keeps referring to. So I feel like uh, the government keeps going to the same old argument, some old tired argument that, you know, oh, there's no such thing as uh, repressing freedom of expression. There's no such thing as uh, cracking down on uh, people's rights to expressing their opinions. The government is just doing their job. And obviously, the Constitution up upholds your rights to, you know, freedom of expression, freedom of opinions. But what I would, what I would say to that is that what is what it, what good is the what what good is it that we have a constitution that guarantees your right to freedom of expression your right to freedom of uh you know to of to your freedom of uh, expression and freedom of expressing your opinions what good is it if in reality the the enforcement isn't there right uh, and i mean you know if we look only at, into the text 
that exists uh, in the status quo, I think we have more than enough uh, protection. I mean, we have a, we have uh, the procedural code. We have a, we have specific laws that regulate it. We have a press freedom law. We have a, a press council. We have, you know, so many things. But in reality, there are still journalists being put in prison for uh, writing news. There are still activists uh, who are just who are who are afraid of even saying the you know the the, the softest criticism of uh, the government. Uh, and in reality, uh, the last thing that I would want to say now before uh, we go to the next speaker is that a lot of people ask me uh, in the past six months, what would I say to people who find themselves being vulnerable or being susceptible to similar attacks? And you know, if you ask me before what happened to me, I would say that you know, a understand the law, b uh, have, have like set up emergency procedure for your close ones. If, you know. Just if you go missing for like more than 24 hours, if you have, uh, if you don't give any updates, then people know, you know, there's something wrong with it. Uh, there's something wrong. But like, at the, uh, I think for the past six months, I've always told people that there's nothing you can do because the government is so powerful, especially today uh, with the current crisis. The, the the government is implementing a lot of Rabio? crisis regulation. Uh, so I think Rabio? much you can do. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So your your time is actually up, but I'm gonna give you one minute to close yes. to close out. No, no, I think uh, what I would close with is that uh, I think the government responsibility here is twofold, right? Uh, first, the government needs to, you know, a lot of people accuse the government of being the, the ones behind these attacks, right? I mean, not just against me, but against a lot of different people, against academia, uh, activists, uh, health workers, etc. But the government keeps telling you that there's no proof that the government did this. But at, uh, the second fault is that the government has responsibility to provide you with justice, to provide you with clarity, to provide you with uh, you know, uh, some legal uh, closure. And the government isn't giving you that. So I mean, even if the government isn't behind these attacks, then the government is still guilty of letting these things happen, letting these things slide, just putting them under the rug and telling people, we're not doing it, so clearly there's no problem. But like, there is a problem. It doesn't really matter if you did it or not. But there is a problem, and you need to acknowledge it. And the government isn't doing anything, uh, let alone doing enough to address it. Okay, thank you so much, Rafio. I think that that gives us uh, the uh, a different point of view about how to see the law. I mean, um, so far we've always seen to people that the law will protect us as long as we understand it, but in implementation, it doesn't always work. It, sometimes, uh, well, things happen like the way you uh, you experience it. And I think it will be very interesting for us to hear how Mas Herlambang later will, uh, will, uh, yeah, will analyze this thing. Thank you so much, Ravio. I'm gonna go to uh, the next speaker, Mas Sapto. Mas Sapto, can you please turn on your uh, microphone? Okay. Uh... You hear my okay. microphone? Yes, thank you so much, Masapto. Masapto, uh, we know that uh, Tirto is also one of the media outlets that's been um, heavily attacked by cyber attacks. So how can you, sh uh, can you share with us how your portal media has been uh, violated by these attacks? And what's your view on the, on the protection that media has from this type of attack? I mean, um, you, we know that media and journalists has been always uh, vulnerable to other types of attacks, but now that you are experiencing cyber attacks, what are the difference protection that, you, that media needs? You have 10 minutes to, um, yeah. Of course, uh, Nita, uh, uh, I, maybe uh, we will share several cases for uh, how, how the attack to uh, about cyber security. I have the presentation. Uh, I, I will share presentation. You can see the presentation. Okay. Need? Yes, we Hello? can see it. Yes, we can see it. Uh, must Maybe I will uh, present. Uh, we have a presentation in English, but uh, we have permission permission uh, to tell in Bahasa. Okay, no problem. Hello, Anit. Uh, yes, okay. If if possible, then English will be uh, will be very beneficial for Melissa to understand, though. Oh, okay. Uh, 
Okay, in English, no problem. We have several cases uh, and experience by Tirto. Uh, just information about the fundamental Tirto was found in August uh, 2016 to provide new space and facts and data analysis. We choose the name Tirto as a tribute to Tirto Adisurya, Indonesian press father, on our hero, and also following our aim to have the same philosophy as Tirta, our water uh, journey, clearly, uh, because uh, Tirta uh, the uh, precise, precise journalism that uh, provides the writing with clarity, uh, support by quantitative and quality, qualitative data, mengalir, flowing, interesting, and proper delivery, uh, flowing like water in the hopes of fulfilling uh, decision makers' need of information. Mencerahkan, insightful, or enlightening, becoming the trust source of information that is enlightening is the midst of the public perception of online journalism. Lack of context, deep, and uh, readability. Because uh, I think there are already many experts here. Uh, as a publisher, we will briefly present the experience of the cases. In April 2017, Tirta published the article investigation of Alan Nair. Maybe uh, somebody uh, still remember. Uh, we get the title, Ahok is just an excuse for treason. A few hours later, the article was trending anywhere. My machine, suddenly the website can be accessed, can't, can't be accessed. The IT team discovered the server uh, was flooded with unknown traffic DDoS for several hours. Issue uh, was addressed by enabling the DDoS mitigation feature. But uh, fortunately, I am. Um, I, I have many, many friends, many friends because I am as the ISP person, uh, technical uh, person, technical person from many ISP have support me uh, and helping our problem. And in August 2018, uh, we find out about the social hacking. The hacker contact the register provider asking for a change in the Tirto name server. Tirto name uh, and as our name server is is uh, very very important. Mr. RD maybe knows about this 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 problem. With several social hacking te technique, uh, finally it's approved by the domain provider. Although only one of the several IPs IPs was approved. Some of the Tirto display has tends to run to the hackers server. Can't the, you, you, you can't imagine. Domain, domain provider restore its original position after our team protests and all our IP fixed and secure. And in uh, just now in August uh, uh, to the 2020, personal Gmail account for one senior editor is hacked. Store password collection within Google Chrome is synced to the hacker's device. The suspicious activity has been alerted by Gmail, but he is not aware. Then there was sensitive news related to the TNE and Corona, which had their content changed. The other additional teams didn't do it. It's discovered it was done from an IP of service. Overseas, India and Singapore using the editor's account. Problem is solving by resetting CMS account or content management system for editor and applying multi level uh, authentication. Uh, in Tirta, we are for our staff, our team, we are think about the independently. We are not think about be positive. 
thing, not think about the negative thinking, but we are is critical thinking. But about the critical thinking is risk. Fight for press freedom in Indonesia online civic spirit under siege. We believe the attack that occur are not accidental, but related to a choice, a critical mind, and a preference for independent journalism. Therefore, finally, we must report to the police as a legal case. This is part of our concern for the media environment for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mas Sabto, for your uh, for your share uh, for uh, your share in the experience of having um, several attacks happening to Tirto.id. I think also there were there were also uh, several months ago ha happening where um, one article of yours was taken down by someone and then you uploaded again one, and then it went. It, it... Not one article, seven articles. Oh, seven, seven articles actually. Seven article. All of and... them are under the same uh, issue, same topic. No, 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 no. Uh, several issues, uh, favorable, favorable issue. Uh, one about K-pop, <laughs> oh, drama K Korea. Okay. One about, one about uh, uh, two about the police. Uh, three about the uh, one, one about the the, the cooking. Also one uh, or two, two or three about the about the corona virus. So now it's safe to say that everything is, is not always related. All these cyber attacks is not always related to politics or uh, public policies, but sometimes it can involve cooking and uh, K-pop too. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn to uh, the next uh, speaker, the next panelist, Mbak um, Yuyun. Mbak Yuyun, can I ask you to turn on your microphone? Yes. Mbak Yuyun, um, now that uh, we've heard so much about the attacks that is happening uh, to, to a lot of people and what has this been described by Shirley as uh, declining in, the, in our freedom on the net index. And now that a cyber attack is considered, of course, yeah, we, we all uh, understand that cyber attack is considered to be a violation to, of human rights. But is the issue of cyber security and cyber resiliency has been brought to attention to the ASEAN level? Is there any agreement among ASEAN member states on what measure should we uh, should we take to handle this problem? Can you share with us your take on that? Uh, your time, ten minutes, starting from now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anita. Uh, good evening, everyone. I've prepared my presentation. Uh, so first, I would like to start with the situation in, in the region. Uh, what I have shared by the previous speakers, uh, I can say it happens also in the, in the region. Um, can I have the PowerPoint presentation, please? <laughs> in the region with different kind of attack, uh, soft attack, hard attack, uh, from all, uh, also... Um, uh, can can you go to the second slide, please? <laughs> and um, the attack uh, uh, using the legal framework as well as the uh, 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 mobilizing the enforcement. So you can. So I just listed down some of the forms of the digital attacks uh, happening in Southeast Asia without mentioning the name of the countries because. Uh, I'm worried that not mentioning the countries, there will be an assumption that uh, these countries do not have the problem. Uh, but what happened in the region is we lack of freedom of express, uh, freedom of press, so we do not know what is actually happening in in some of countries. But from the sharing, uh, I from the sharing uh, of cases and information in different workshops, as well as those who send some of the cases to me, I can uh, I can say that this kind of attack also happened in all 10 countries. And 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 I think the, the previous speakers also mentioned that actors is not only the government, including military, but also civilians. So this, this from the perspective of human rights, uh, having civilians uh, violating some of the uh, some of the freedom and, and rights that make rather different way of looking at the issues. Uh, so I also saw and received a lot of uh, complaints and and informations that 
uh, attacking uh, coming from a civilian, rather paid or voluntary. And um, private sectors also uh, uh, join uh, uh, this kind of uh, attack against uh, usually uh, a civil society organization, the poor people, and others. So I I, I mentioned some of the uh, legal approaches. As uh, many countries have uh, cybersecurity law with different kind of uh, uh, approaches. I think what Shirley mentioned earlier, whether it is uh, uh, protecting the system or protecting the human, that's very very important question to us, uh, to to the region. I think I sh there is something that I need to look at uh, further. And uh, hate speech is another way of uh, 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 demoralizing uh, civil society, as well as what happened with the protests, uh, current protests in Indonesia and current protests of students uh, in Thailand. There are a lot of hate speeches uh, around uh, social media against these students. Uh, and a part of also uh, silencing the uh, uh, dissent, I think also it creates a climate of fear among population of not uh, saying anything that uh, possibly um, often uh, the government or the power. Uh, next slide, please. Um, um, uh, I can't remember. Okay, so I, f I, I borrowed this list of uh, laws uh, from Asian Democracy Network. Uh, uh, luckily, uh, the, the organization has identified some of the problematic laws that against or possibly uh, jeopardize or danger the freedom of uh, opinion and expression. Uh, next slides. Uh, ASEAN uh, Asian Democracy Network also make a, a mapping on um, what kind of freedoms that the most violated in the region in Southeast Asia and those who are uh, victims, uh, becoming victims from uh, uh, the, the, the violation of the freedoms. Uh, that is in the next slide. Uh, perhaps you will be seeing in this uh, next slide, uh, Asian Democracy Network has identified uh, groups like uh, uh, Human rights defenders, uh, poor, uh, journalists, uh, ethnic minorities, religious uh, minorities, as well as academic, uh, becoming the target of the restriction of uh, freedom. Uh, next slide, please. I think the, the other next slide. <laughs> uh, so that's the situation in the region. Next. Uh, now I would like to look at how this, how this situation reflects on the interest of ASEAN in looking at the situation, uh, what kind of framework that ASEAN is actually uh, working on. So when we when we look at this cyberspace and landscape, there are four at least there are four angles that we can we can see from the uh, ASEAN cooperation. The first one is ASEAN look at this cyberspace from the perspective of security. So the ASEAN political security community has security cooperation framing uh, uh, this uh, space as cyber crime. Uh, cyber resilient also mentioned. Uh, the definition is not yet clear. Uh, they also talk about cyber uh, terrorism, uh, uh, cyber attack. So, so this particular community talk about how the security threats uh, in 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 for in the form of cyber, so it's uh, I I think I I I should mention this. Uh, if you look at what is the position actually uh, 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 hosted by ASEAN in terms of cybersecurity, it's ASEAN would like to ad adopt a set of common voluntary and non-binding norms responsible for state behavior. So there is a recognition of state behavior of manipulating, maximizing, or exploiting uh, uh, cyber issues. Uh, but the, the norms that ASEAN would like to establish is rather uh, a voluntary and non-binding norms like declaration, statement, uh, instruments. It's not convention. It is not a bind uh, a member state to follow or to comply with certain norms. 
And uh, at the same time, uh, the position of ASEAN uh, as reflected in the ASEAN leader statement in 2018, uh, uh, believe that spy, uh, uh, cyberspace uh, rests on the trust and confidence of using the cyberspace. I remember I've read uh, Damar uh, article about that he believes on trust in governing the uh, uh, cyberspace. So, so I think uh, uh, there there is a recognition about the problems, and at least at, as of now, there are two kind of approaches or kind of uh, ways that ASEAN would like to go: set the common norms, non-binding, voluntary, and emphasize on the trust. The second angle in looking at this uh, cyberspace is human rights issues. I will be looking at later uh, uh, in the next slide. And the other one in all is on the uh, child rights issues and as uh, social cultural issues. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, from the perspective of human rights, uh, so I uh, come from the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. I'm the representative of Indonesia in this uh, Human Rights Commission. Uh, we are working based on the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. Uh, so our main dates uh, in relation to freedom of expression, opinion, and other rights is to come up with standard setting, policy supports, uh, coming up with the uh, uh, protection, dialogue, engagement, and human rights strategies. In December 2019, uh, ICHR organized activities and we have a lot of inputs from civil society organization, from ASEAN sectoral bodies, from ASEAN member state and also uh, uh, scholars on what are the dig digital rights. So the word digital rights is very new in ASEAN. So this is something that we need to uh, campaign further in, in this region. So it can the recognition from, from the ASEAN. But uh, I'm, I'm quite happy that we already discussed it uh, last year and it required further discussion later on. One of the good recommendation, there are a lot of good recommendation, but for the purpose of this meeting. Hey, Yun? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you have one more minute. Yeah, okay. So, uh, 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 ICHR need to come up with the guideline on balancing national security uh, and human rights protection. And next slide, please. Um, now, as, now ICHR has a complaint mechanism, uh, still very limited step, three steps. So we receive complaint and then country will respond to the complaints. And another uh, sectoral bodies that responsible for information uh, and cyberspace is actually SOMRI, Senior Official Meeting on uh, Related Information. Uh, they have they work with gov with journalists, but they do not look at the right of journalists. So that uh, so it seems like there is a, a fragmented assignment. Whenever it comes to right of journalists, it it will become the responsibility of ICHR. Next slide is my last slide, I think. From the perspective of uh, child rights, uh, currently the uh, ACWC, the Commission on Women and Children, come up with the Declaration on the Protection of Children or, or from all forms of online exploitation, looking at these uh, seven uh, areas of uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, including engaging private sector, legal framework, uh, capacity building, national uh, specialized unit, uh, welfare, and data collection. So I think that's my last uh, slide. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayu Yun. I think uh, we need to step back and see that uh, the, that behind the set uh, the setup of ASEAN is actually uh, this um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, this norm of not intru not being intrusive to other uh, to other countries other uh, other state members, but more like. Um, um, agreeing on what norms are we taking and basically uh, they serve more as a um, recommendation rather than something that 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 has to be followed by member states thank you so much i think we will uh, be it will be add to a more richer um, uh, discussion after this um, i'm going to turn to our uh, fifth uh, panelist melissa hathaway melissa can you turn on your microphone? Yes, good evening, thank you. I'm going to share my screen also, if you yeah. can 
Let me know if you see it. And yeah. Okay. So, Melissa, I think everyone here is waiting for your presentation. So, um, maybe just to, uh, just to give us a little bit of context, I think we really need to uh, to hear from you. What are the fundamentals that we need to understand about cybersecurity and cyber resiliency? And based on a lot of your experience in initiating CNCI and everything that you've worked on before, and given what you've heard from other panelists, do you think that such guidance like CNCI or other measures can be can uh, possibly be adopted in Indonesia? I, I think that um, it's really important to understand um, the critical businesses and services um, and infrastructures to Indonesia and to engage in a consultation process like we're doing actually this evening um, of gathering insights on what is important to society to m raise awareness on the attacks and the and the challenges that Indonesia is facing so that you can come up with a collective response. Um, so I, I do think that we can um, that we can uh, uh, learn from each other and, and everything. So I prepared a few slides. Please tell me or interrupt me if you can't see them. Um, on just to give that some of that awareness. So uh, uh, my talk is in three sections really that the digital attacks are escalating um, <clears throat> and the disruptive and destructive activities are increasing, especially now as we've moved more and more of society online because of COVID, um, we're seeing, seeing um, a fair amount of, in, of uh, stealing of sensitive data, uh, including intellectual property and personal data um, in the United States and Germany and elsewhere, we're seeing the compromise of medical research um, in order to try to advance certain countries uh, obtaining the actual vaccine. We're seeing influence campaigns and, um, and other uh, propaganda techniques of disseminating propaganda, which some of our um, our panelists have already talked to this evening. <clears throat> I'm really worried about the disruption of critical services and infrastructures and businesses through ransomware and malicious software that's um, exploiting our business software and the vulnerabilities that are pervasive through society. Um, you're seeing uh, some countries and criminal networks attack our financial networks and our cryptocurrency exchanges to generate revenue. Um, and then, you know, we are seeing the internet used to recruit terrorists and um, and and spread um, really hate speech and other things, and then to direct violent attacks. Uh, so it, it's not really a good news story of the internet um, and how it's being used. This year alone in 2020, we're seeing a 700% increase in ransomware attacks, which again is what I'm really worried about going on around the world. Um, as one of our colleagues said earlier, we're seeing an increase in distributed denial of service attacks. And then as we connect more and more devices to the internet, we're seeing um, as the internet of things or industrial internet of things, we've seen a 600% increase in the attacks using those vulnerable devices to then again, enable a distributed denial of service attack um, or um, other uh, act, uh, malicious activities. Uh, so, you know, what, what is at risk? Well, our money is at risk, the global financial system, um, and you're seeing the loss of personal identifiable information and real money out of our banks. You're seeing the loss of personal information and personal health information from our hospitals and medical facilities that are being used to monetize on the underground economy and the dark web. Uh, our corporations are losing their intellectual property and their trade secrets to advance the interests of other countries and other companies. You're seeing significant business disruption. The free flow of goods, services, data, and capital across borders is being disrupted through the denial of service, through censorship, through ransomware. And then we're seeing a, a mass destructive um, malicious software against our corporations and our critical infrastructures that's destroying real property. And, um, and this requires us to have a, a much deeper conversation at the national level, at our sovereignty, as well as the international level, which was discussed, you know, the, the norms of, of responsible state behavior that the 
ASEAN states have, have signed up to and Indonesia is endorsing, I think it's really important as we think about cross-border data flows and, and cross-border responsibilities. The ransomware though, you know, is really becoming prolific. A 700% increase this year, especially as our companies are moving more and more online and our employees were doing work from home and we're doing school from home. You know, this is just a small sample of the last few uh, months um, ranging from insurance companies to IT services, to business services, to electronics and, um, and the like. And what's happening is, is the, the ransomware first comes in through an exploitable vulnerability through Microsoft or Citrix or Cisco or Oracle, pick your, pick your business system that's vulnerable. And the attackers basically map the system, they steal or illegally copy the information then in the second phase, they encrypt information um, and your um, enterprise. And then in the third phase, they basically demand the ransom. So the, you know, the value at risk is the business disruption, it's the data loss, it's the regulatory fines. It's, it's quite significant. The other trend that's happened over the last six to eight months is that the telecom, the cloud and the infrastructure outages are going significantly up. It's began in February, March with Tata Communications, IBM's cloud went down globally. T-Mobile here in the United States had a day, a day long outage. Akamai had a, a, a distributed denial of service at scale. Sky and Talk Talk and Virgin Media in the UK, London was without communications for half a day. Google is having um, global outages. Zoom has had regional outages. Microsoft has had four outages in the last two weeks. Equinix, Telstra had a global outage. And so when you start to see the, the overall, um, the, comp, the, the, the vulnerability and fragility of our telecommunications infrastructure, if it goes down, then everything else goes down. So what we need to communicate to our colleagues in, our, in our, both our industry and at our government level is that enterprise risk management needs to be thinking digital and we need to be thinking digital resilience at the national level um, and, and that becomes super important. The second part of my talk is that there are best practices for a public-private partnership or a private-public partnership for enabling that collaboration. And the first stage in that collaboration is in in engaging in a consultation process. This is really important because our government leaders are well-intentioned, but they don't always understand the aspects of uh, the businesses um, and the nuances within their, uh, their verticals. When I had the opportunity to work for President Obama, we did engage in a consultation process as we were revising the national strategy and the policy process. And we had input from all of society and received hundreds of different papers that we published. Australia just also went through a consultation process as it updated its cybersecurity strategy and um, it too published what its inputs were from civil society and from the business community, recognizing that laws needed to be updated, that we needed to potentially redefine what critical services and infrastructures are and, and need to be. So as Indonesia is updating its cybersecurity strategy and law, it will be important for it to engage in a consultation process similar to what we're talking about this evening. As the businesses are, are facing many threats, um, and whether it's ransomware, malicious software, fake news, et cetera, it's important to potentially adopt a stoplight protocol for a speed of response. This currently is being used and adopted by most of the financial services community, meaning that when the government or industry comes with really important information on how to better defend yourself from these malicious attacks, Red means urgent, you must pay attention to the information. Amber means that it's important and, and requires attention. And then green is, is, it is also important, but it's not urgent or required. The stoplight protocol is helping our financial services sector stay more secure and resilient in the face of an increasing and growing number of attacks. We're also seeing automated information sharing protocols enabled through um, uh, the machine to machine so that they can, the, our machines actually can become more uh, defendable 
uh, based on its information sharing. These sticks and taxi protocols were developed here in the United States and they were shared also across uh, and being used all around the world. And then finally, my third part is we really need to achieve transparency um, about how information is being used and, and discussing the, um, uh, the overall ubiquitous platforms of collection of surveillance of the technology and how it, it is being um, and could be used for harm. Uh, and we are now really in a hyper-connected and collected society. The declining cost of storage, um, the ability to process more and more data sources. We have sensors on our streets. We have cameras on our phones. We have a geospatial technology that comes with every IP connected device that we use. So we live in a near ubiquitous world of data collection, which also enables for surveillance and, um, and, and maybe abuse of using and collecting this data. It's important to note that in 2016, the United Nations said that Internet disruption is a violation is of human is rights. That? Yes. I'm sorry, yeah. you have two more minutes? Yep, I'm almost done. Okay. Um, and that communication should be inherently uh, private and that our freedoms offline should be the same that we protect online. And that is really important for freedom of expression um, and as we move forward. So, you know, as I want to thank SafeNet and all of the sponsors this evening, achieving the cyber ecosystem and advancing it together requires our right to access to the internet, our right to freedom of expression on the internet, and we must be able to do so safely and securely, which means that we have to build resilience in, in the face of these threats. I wanna thank you this evening to be able to be participating and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Anita. Thank you so much, Melissa. I think we, are, we can all agree that right now cyber resilience is one of the key things that we have to, um, we have to possess uh, with all the digital uh, technology growing and all the threats coming from every direction. Um, okay, so I'm going to move to the last uh, panelist that we have right now, um, Paher Lambang. Thank you, Anita. So, Paher Lambang, yeah. yeah, before we start, I, I really want to uh, touch with you on these things that uh, you, a lot of participants are actually ask, asking these questions right now. Do we have enough or, uh, laws and regulations that exist right now to protect us from cyber attacks? Is there anything that, 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 that protect us? And if we do have enough laws and regulations, how are the implementation of these laws? Um, Ravio has touched base on that. He has mentioned that. And Melissa also uh, talked about um, building uh, regulations where consultation process is needed. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, looking at the trend right now for the past two years, um, consultation process that involves public participation is quite limited in this country. So what do you think can we do to push more protection? Uh, 10 minutes for you, Master Lamba. Yes, uh, precisely correct. Actually, I saw it already in the chat room. <laughs> so my my points would be uh, focusing on law and uh, its enforcement, and then uh, uh, by posing a question, how actually uh, how do the laws and its enforcement uh, for the protection of civil liberties in the case of digital attacks? Uh, what is the legal? Uh, what, what is the law regarding the protection of uh, digital rights, including personal data? Uh, is it sufficient uh, protection or not? Or, and why? And uh, the second question is: How should the governments actually develop more protective uh, laws? And uh, what active roles can uh, civil societies, organizations, and also media uh, play in uh, responding uh, this issue? There are next next slide, please. Yes, next. Uh, there are several issues that already covered by the previous uh, presenters, and uh, I just focus on several issues that uh, it might be necessary for us to uh, to be aware that we have law and we have uh, issues that are really are disconnected to each other, and you know. Uh, these are based on my research, uh, especially dealing with freedom of expression, human rights defenders, uh, press freedom, and academic freedom. Uh, those are really uh, affected by 
all digital uh, attacks in this regard. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have actually constitutional protection based on Article 28, talking about uh, freedom of expression. Although uh, not all are agree, uh, including me, because uh, the following words in that article shall be regulated by law. It means that can be reduced by uh, operational laws. Uh, but we have also another laws that talking about the right to protection uh, for the citizens and also uh, Article 28F uh, talking about the right to communication and to obtain, to obtain uh, information. Next slide, please. Uh, we have known that many uh, cases related to this issue because of, uh, for instance, like uh, personal data uh, or privacy issues that that can can be be uh, easily dig for misuse uh, purpose, uh, as uh, we have known from the uh, articles that I quoted from Kumparan, the next slide, please. Uh, cases of leakage of personal data in the context of COVID-19 patients, uh, 230,000 COVID-19 patients uh, and sold on the Red Forum's website. So the data consists of reported status, respondent name, nationality, sex, age, uh, telephone number, residence address, uh, ID, uh, and race, and so on. So that's really uh, can be can be uh, uh, disseminated without uh, proper uh, use. And the next slide, please. Uh, and as we discuss about the Rafio Patra case, uh, there are numerous uh, attacks. Rafio Patra, as mentioned, uh, actually no responsibility after that. Uh, the tech journalists also were. Uh, uh, got uh, doxing related to uh, his report on Jokowi's activity. Uh, Mas Budi Stiarso case from Tempo also was uh, his his Instagram account was hacked, uh, and also hacking uh, to many cell phones, including uh, the human rights uh, uh, monitor group Al Araf, and also director of Amnesty International, and myself actually uh, was hacked. Uh, Tirto and Tempo and Panduriono already mentioned by previous uh, presenters on this issue. And how about the law? Uh, yes, we have uh, several actually uh, laws that can be uh, supporting for defending uh, digital rights uh, since although uh, the, the word of digital rights uh, uh, is not familiar in this context, but uh, growing numbers of uh, articles I saw uh, from journals that uh, they uh, get, they are getting used this word in order to uh, promote one of current freedom of expression issues. Uh, we have uh, ICCPR, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ratified already in 2005. Uh, we have also uh, Electronic Information and Transaction uh, Bill. But uh, the law, of course, as you have known, that many controversial issues because uh, introduced the cyber defamation that is really fluid and can be misused easily. Uh, but by having this law also uh, allows communications interception is included and prohibits the use of any personal data through electronic media without the consent of that person under Article 26. And also already mentioned by uh, Yu Yun in the, uh, the in the table about the law of intelligence authorized the Indonesian State Intelligence Agency includes communication surveillance and also data protection laws. Actually, there are many uh, data protection laws uh, separate, yeah, not in one uh, bills, but unfortunately, unclear mechanism for responsibility, and of course, uh, because of that, no responsibility. Uh, next slide, please. And I just want to mention about several institutions related to this issue. Uh, the first one is uh, the Strategic Intelligence Agency, or BAIS, uh, under the command of National Armed Force uh, Headquarters, and also uh, State Intelligence Agency, and National Crypto Agency, uh, non-ministerial government agency engaged in protecting the security uh, uh, 
of state secret information and gathering signals intelligence uh, should be mandated by presidential decree. And uh, Indonesian, Indonesian national police also has uh, communication surveillance capacities. And the last one is uh, anti-graph commission actually has a uh, possibility to uh, intercept communications. But uh, these institutions, actually, we need to be careful about the, to what extent actually those uh, institutions can be accountable in, work, uh, in doing uh, uh, surveillance and also uh, by having such capacities uh, can do a sort of like censorship. Because it's really difficult to identify right now uh, what happened to Tempo, uh, Tirto, IP, uh, the press, and also targeting the academia as well as uh, Rafi Vatra as an uh, activist. Next slide, please. I just want to focus on this slide. What issues actually uh, relate to these all uh, digital uh, attacks? Of course, we have uh, data protection laws uh, in separate but uh, no actually no data protection bill uh, as a integrated law to measure to make uh, accountability more uh, clearer and also which institution actually should be responsible for that uh, the other issue is about criminalization and the use of cyber defamations uh, targeting uh, many of uh, uh, citizens including press workers uh, academia and also activists, human rights activists, and digital attacks. Uh, we thought, of, of course, as I mentioned in the early presentations about the uh, responsibility, still a question mark, uh, especially from the authorities. Uh, on the other hand, also discriminatory in law enforcement, uh, because if you if you have a problem with the digital attacks you will get nothing because no responsibility from the authorities who should be uh, brought to the justice. But on vice versa, if there is a, a particular part of the regime uh, got attacked from the somebody else, uh, unknown, and then it, it suddenly can be uh, brought to the uh, 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 ju judicial process easily. And uh, I can mention some of them. Uh, later on. And uh, in the context of this uh, digital technology, also hoax industry as a, uh, an issue that it's really producing fake news, uh, disinformation, and pro propaganda disseminated online actually have poisoned the public sphere. Uh, what Lamba, happened with this? Lamba, yeah. You have one more uh, minute. One more minute. One more minute. Okay. And then uh, I just want to put this context. The context of why uh, this happened actually uh, because of digital authoritarianism. Based on my research, uh, the rise of authoritarian the rise the rise of authoritarianism in Indonesia actually uh, uh, becomes stronger and stronger from year to year, uh, at least from uh, last year to this year, uh, because of uh, many of uh, fundamental uh, freedoms. Uh, have been easily attacked without responsibility, while the government itself uh, easily misused for uh, attacking the civil liberties in this context. Uh, I just want to end with the last slide. Yes, no data protection. Impunity as a serial, serious problems in this regard and uh, vulnerable citizen in the age of media technology and the last one, of course, this is part of uh, human rights violations, terror, intimidation, and misuse of data. Uh, these are my uh, points for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Master Lambang. I think you've covered a lot of ground with this uh, uh, with this subject, especially in terms of the laws and regulations that we have, and what is not covered by our laws, and what is actually not protected, and what are the threats that are happening right now and where we are heading as a society. Um, I'm going to go first uh, to Mbak Shirley um, to ask a question. Mbak Shirley, um, can I have you on the mic? Sure. Yeah, okay. Mbak Shirley, um, you've, uh, you've mentioned about uh, the question whether we are, uh, which one are we supposed to focus on? Is it, is it the system or is it the human? Well, if we look at the society in Indonesia, where we see that the literacy level is quite low, 
people people do not have people read only of fu- for function for for its function but not necessarily to understand or to be able to for instance uh, verify information and everything and very very easily prone to propaganda do you think it will be very it will be wise to focus on the human side first i mean it is of course very important to have them escalated in terms of the digital literacy level but also it's going to be taking a lot of time to get uh, the people to the level where we want to actually be able to protect ourselves. So with this kind of situation, which one do you think should we focus on? Or is it possible to actually focus on both? What do you think? Okay, so uh, to answer your question, I would like to draw to a journal article that I read recently. It's about how actually the UK government is also struggling to be governance ready in order for them to be able to govern the use of algorithms and big data in this digital age. So they are wondering what are the public values that we should put forward uh, instead of the other public values? And what are the goals, what are the purposes that we want to communicate to the publics that, uh, okay, we want to be an AI oriented uh, country, but how to do it? What are the risks? So they have the consultation with the publics, they invited uh, experts, to their policy making processes and they are open to the discussion they are open to the input and until they can make uh, some roadmaps on ai and big data so i think uh, the issue is not only within the public to understand the complexities of uh, the online realm the online sphere uh, but also within the governments around the world they are also struggling to understand this issue because uh, the way the internet is working is not centralized to one certain entity, but it is distributed to like the operators of critical internet infrastructure and to the those uh, digital platforms operators and also the policy making actors in the government sector. So I think Indonesia needs to discuss, Indonesia needs to agree first within our country, within our publics that actually as a country, which value that we want to put forward? Are we going to sacrifice one over another or are we going to manage these two but not, sacri- but not sacrifice, uh, sacrificing uh, the public's interests? Okay, I thank you. Yeah, it does. So I think uh, well, we have. Uh, there are so many things that we need to uh, to uh, put into consideration, including uh, that this is not uh, this is not just something that we have to focus on one thing or one area, but it is an ecosystem which actually has to be built together, and all uh, uh, all, all members of the ecosystem has to uh, chip in to create uh, the safe net, safe uh, the safe environment that we we all need to be able to protect ourselves. Thank you so much, Ma. Uh, I'm going to move to Ravio now. Ravio, based on your experience, uh, of course you have, it's very understandable that you have uh, such a low opinion on, on the implementation of the law. But now that we are in our space with, with our condition, with our vulnerability to uh, these cyber attacks, what do you think needs to be built by the CSO, by the activists, by the media, by the journalists, by the academicians. What are the things that we really have to work on? Is there any formula that we can build together? Is there any coalition that you think we should uh, start creating and developing? What do you think? Uh, Thanks, Anipa. Uh, So I think uh, twofold again. Uh, First is that I want to say that uh, probably saying that I I don't have any trust in the law enforcement would be you know, would imply that there is no hope for us. So I don't want to say that, but I do think that uh, the great, the greater hope right now is for us to believe it, to believe more in civil society. Uh, when, when, when I went through my experience, uh, civil society was key to, you know, my protection. Like, I mean, organizations such as Mafindo as well, which you are on, uh, SafeNet, Digital Defenders Partnership, they came together very quickly uh, without, you know, unprompted. Uh, and they provided a lot of uh, measures for me to, you know, further protect myself. And I think secondly is that I want to draw because I was very interested by Melissa's uh, presentation earlier that, you know, in the global, in the bigger scheme of things, uh, cybersecurity and cyber resilience seems to be seem to be focused on 
you know, protecting our pers personal data, uh, protecting business interests, uh, national interests, etc. But in reality, at least in the Southeast Asia re Asian region, it seems like those are not the focus yet, right? Like, I mean, uh, we've seen it happen in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Thailand, in Myanmar, especially in Indonesia as well. We've seen cybersecurity laws not being used to protect, you know, private uh, privacy, not being used to protect business interests, but being used to just simply suppress any criticisms of the government, any loud voices that the government feels like, uh, you know, feels uh, uh, threatening their uh, their power. So I think uh, at the end of the day, I do be I do still believe. Uh, unfortunately, I do still believe in uh, public-private partnership. But it, it in 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 reality, there's also another aspect of it, which is uh, I think uh, Herlambang mentioned it. There's a uh, an information warfare going on, right? Uh, an information warfare, but, and and there's a lot of us, at least in Indonesia, that believe the government is funding this what we call buzzers, influencers online, and they're very political. They're they're uh, very coordinated, uh, and there seems to be no coordinated efforts from civil society right now to tackle this. Like we talk about it a lot, like we talk about it a lot on social media, on the TV, on the internet. We say that buzzers are a problem for democracy. Buzz influence, uh, political influencers are creating a unsafe space on the internet. But where's the like you know? And it's also a question, a demand for myself. Uh, we need to come together and you know build a coalition do something like, you know, one part of it is research, uh, finding where the roots of all these evils is. Uh, another part of it is adv advocacy to make sure that these are, uh, you know, regulated by laws. And I think these are the, the biggest homeworks that we have right now. And we're not look, we're not there yet. Like we're not even looking at the real problems. Like we're just looking at it as case by case. And, you know, and then suddenly, and then for uh, after a while we forget about it and then nobody does anything that is remotely systemic to solve it. So I think uh, that would be my take on it. Yeah, I think so. You're absolutely right. I think what we are doing is actually handling, uh, trying to fight fire. But then after the fire is down, then we got back to our lives. And then suddenly mm -hmm. uh, we forgot about it and forgot about building a system that actually can provide us with uh, protection. And then mm -hmm. another case happened and then the same cycle happens again. So thank you so much for reminding us about that, which means that we have a huge homework to, to finally uh, figure out on what is the coordinated movement that we need to have, what kind of coalition that we need to provide, what kind of, uh, what kind of formulation that we can agree upon and act on so that uh, we can actually build protection for ourselves and we have resiliency for ourselves. Thanks, Ravio. Um, Masapto, I'm going to go to you. Um, Masapto? Yeah, I'm okay. Yes. okay. So, yes, Masapto, I'm your Masato, yes. this is uh, my question is, uh, you know that uh, several media outlets like Tirto and several others like Tempo, where you are trying to always just report on things based on the values that you uphold uh, in each media outlet, and um, you don't take sides politically, so you are not uh, siding with any sides uh, in terms of the of the um, political division that we have since last year or since the last five years. But we have to admit that in a, in a widely polarized society that we have right now, like Indonesia, it seems that the attacks that um, media or journalists or activists received is perceived by half of the public as somewhat, um, some, somehow they see it as, well, you deserve it for going up against my side, you know? So it's kind of being normalized by the public. So what do you think should, should be in place in order for you to, um, you know, uh, put the normalizing tone down and really bringing back uh, the, uh, the, critics, the, the critical thinking back in this society? Okay, <laughs> thank you, Anita. Uh, I think uh, Rafio have addresses about the, the, the case. Uh, uh, you know, you know, the political, particularly now, is uh, many many people has things. Uh, it must be black and white in the politics. Uh, you are my group, or not? And even though this media is must be independent, must be independent. Uh, we have the press law. Uh, when 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 the press law is uh, have uh, have the uh, get to to me about the we should we should 
we should be control the the situation, control the the government, control the the social social control, uh, like press law. Uh, it is uh, the the situation is uh, not uh, not uh, thing about the people like the buzzer. They think they think uh, they are, they are anti critic anti critic uh, from the press. Uh, I think how how the the the, the media the publisher uh, as a part of the CSO. It should be the unity uh, with another CSO. How to make this something that this situation uh, we uh, everybody have a, have a, the, the the position as the as the control as the uh, uh, information as 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 etc. Uh, you know uh, this, this is the government or the uh, who is the responsibility about the situation is know about the 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 the, the awards. Our position, Nita. Okay, thank you. So it's not so much about the position of the media outlet, but it's more like uh, building a, a, a more general uh, position of the society uh, yeah. and okay. trying to represent that uh, that yes. position. Okay, thank you so much, Mas. Exactly. Thank okay. you. Uh, so yes. uh, I'm I'm going to uh, Mayuyun. Mayuyun. Yes. I think uh, well, there is a question uh, on the on the chat for, uh, on the chat box uh, that uh, ask about uh, to what extent can Asian and its relevant forums facilitate discussions on the need to implement a civilian centric instead of uh, state centric cybersecurity and resilience framework. You've uh, you've answered the question in the chat room, but I think it will be very beneficial for us to uh, listen more and to hear more about it. Can you elaborate, please? Sure. Uh, I answered the question by saying that I cannot speak on behalf of other sectoral bodies, but I uh, will continue to talk about freedom of expression and opinion. Uh, Indonesia is proponent of this project, so we are going to continue what we have done uh, in December 2019 and also continue to talk about uh, more on the ferry issue as we discuss now on uh, digital rights. Uh, to enter uh, some kind of uh, language in ASEAN community. Uh, we are, well, I cannot speak on behalf of others, but I, uh, ICHER Indonesia, uh, wanted to include this kind of uh, language into the next uh, blueprint. So the current blueprint uh, worked from 2016 until 2025. So it means that by 2024, we are going to draft a new one for another 15 years. So when a language entered the ASEAN community uh, building project, it means recognition becoming more and uh, acknowledgement becoming more uh, um, having a space in the community uh, project. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, we need to do a lot of things like uh, uh, the lack of or uh, yeah, the lack of uh, social movement right now is actually contributing of the lack of uh, language in, in community building because uh, the understanding about digital rights are not equal to one country to another. Uh, some issues are very new, uh, uh, even not recognized at all. Uh, that would be uh, um, uh, our homework. So I, uh, I would like to use this opportunity also to suggest that uh, um, there will be more and more discussion about uh, digital rights, bringing all ASEAN countries together. So civil society who do not uh, uh, aware or familiar of the issue can uh, get uh, uh, informed about the issue. So because because when they uh, they see the, the 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 problem and then they will look at their own context and then they realize that it's actually happening in their own countries without knowing how to do how to respond to that so i think the space regional space to discuss further on this is very important secondly uh, uh, regional organization on journalists is no more exist it's it's it come into hold uh, sipa so this asia press alliance is no longer uh, established uh, supposed to be based in in bangkok so i was uh, i hope uh, um, media practitioners here uh, 
will be able to revive this kind of idea because this is the this is the organization that can uh, uh, push for the right of a journalist, uh, also uh, for the independent uh, uh, press freedom. So, and we need that in this region. So, I hope uh, um, some journalists will be able. Uh, there is Andy Bayuni here. <laughs> To, will be able to push this idea forward. We need that regional uh, uh, network on uh, uh, press freedom in in the region, and that would be very very helpful for uh, for our work in at the regional level. Thank you so much, Mbak Yuyun. Uh, aside from Mas Andy Bayuni that is here, who is actually uh, one of the uh, member of external uh, Facebook external board, I think. <laughs> There's also Ma, uh, Margarete Hazelia from Facebook Indonesia, who's also present right now. So hopefully they can, uh, they are be, uh, they will be able to join you for the consultation meeting at Union. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ma Yuyun again. Melissa, uh, I'm going to cram two questions to you just because we are running out of time. Well, first is, uh, there's this one uh, question from our audience, uh, Ma Imam Malafi. She asked, uh, because of the lack of information that we have in Indonesia about uh, the, the cyber resilience, which she is researching right now, uh, what do you think will, Will be uh, will be used uh, to measure the level of cyber resilience that uh, that one can have in one society. That's uh, question number one. And question number two is, uh, if we were to build our own cyber resilience, what are the steps to do that? And what are the things that we really need to take focus on? Please, um, okay, well, Alisa. Yep. Yeah. Yep. No, that's perfect. Um, you know, I. Uh, uh, published um, a number of uh, documents. One was uh, the Cyber Readiness Index, and it's available, you know, to the methodology of how you think about becoming cyber ready or digital readiness of a society. Um, and then I worked on um, uh, the uh, National Cybersecurity Framework with the ITU and World Bank. And then um, I prepared a third document for the Organization of American States to think about national, uh, again, how do you manage national cyber risk? And each one of those is sort of an evolution of how to think about um, becoming uh, more digitally resilient or ready as a country. Um, and, you know, so uh, when I think about um, Indonesia, uh, you know, I look at it as, you're, you know, a very large archipelago you know, the bridge between oceans and continents. Um, your GDP is largely derived from the services industry, um, uh, industry, manufacturing and mining, and then agriculture. You're a financial hub in the region. Um, and, you know, you're, you're fast growing. And so there's a lot of actually opportunity um, for the country. But the country really needs to think about what are the most important of its digital dependencies when it comes to uh, those industries that are driving the GDP growth that are giving the opportunity and job creation to your citizens. Um, who are the most important companies? What are the most important services? Where are the key infrastructures and the key assets like the nine deep water ports that enable you to be the, you know, really the economic hub of the Malacca Straits. And then I would advise that you have to look at those are the, whatever those top priorities are, you need to create a digital agenda around it of how you're gonna create more connectivity. How are you going to enable society to participate more? Um, what's the research and development strategy and the overall education process that comes to bring society together? Um, and then the industrial policies and the other aspects, the wrappers around it. So when I think about measuring resilience, I first need to get the baseline of what am I dependent upon, how am I going to evolve it, and then how do I ensure that it's becoming more safe, secure, resilient as I'm, I'm connecting more and more parts of my society to the internet. Right now, as we are connecting more and more vulnerable devices, we're actually making our society less resilient as opposed to more resilient. And so I think we need to think about those vulnerabilities that we're introducing or the connectivity that we're promoting, and then how do we ensure that it's safe, secure, and resilient? Okay, thank you, Melissa. I think, um, yeah, this, this is the, the biggest question that we really need to ask ourselves is, what are we dependent on? So, and let's bring our focus on, on creating the strength and, uh, uh, and strategies around the, uh, that area. Thank you so much. So I'm going to the last uh, panelist. 
Masa lambang? Masa lambang, I know that you've, uh, I know that you've uh, talked about uh, the possibility of we are going to the direction of digital authoritarianism. But uh, based on that, what do you think should happen in Indonesia to avoid that to, uh, to happen? Yeah, well, it, it's quite a difficult question, yeah. Uh, since, you know, uh, people believe with the democracy, but it turns uh, easily in the last uh, couple of years, especially during Jokowi's uh, administration. And uh, secondly, uh, it also relates to the uh, legacy of authoritarianism that we have no uh, 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 the way or solution way in order to stop or to end this kind of uh, political economic oligarch that really embedded in our uh, cartelized political system. Therefore, I would uh, I would argue that uh, we have to uh, we have to refer to the our constitution that Indonesia actually is based on rule of law, uh, not a rule of the law not rule of the the rulers and therefore this this is uh, our uh, political contract uh, and hence uh, we need to uh, uh, we need to emphasize that actually in order to uh, avoid the in order to minim minimize the digital attacks the government should, should consider uh, or adopt the law uh, in relation to for instance like uh, data protection law and uh, and also considering about cyber security but the problem as as you have known that uh, uh, the cyber security as aspect that uh, the government now is uh, really formulating is focuses only uh, cyber conflicts uh, and less pay comprehensive attention to the elements of uh, cyber, cyber security uh, sort of like uh, throwing human rights ideas in this uh, regard uh, in relation to the, I think, I, I just want to add uh, 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 answer, especially from the Anya, yeah? Anya uh, from against uh, French press. Uh, she asks about the widespread hoax, uh, and then the government plan to make uh, laws in relation to this. And of course, my position is digital rights is human rights. The way to limit should be uh, consistent to human rights standard. Uh, the way to limit actually should be based on article uh, under uh, ICCPR, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, especially Article 19, uh, Section 3. And then we have to refer to uh, the development of doctrine, uh, that we have to use this kind of uh, doctrine in order to underpin our uh, policies. And uh, in the context of emergency, especially, we have to revert, uh, for instance, like Johannesburg principles in order to solve the problem. So in, in this regard, I'm afraid without considering human rights element, especially the way to limit, uh, actually, uh, it will be easily misused by the government in formulating the law. So that's my position is uh, we have to be careful and the civil society should be uh, uh, involved in uh, monitoring uh, the policy reform. Right, thank you. So um, I think we really need to go back to the values that there is that are embedded in democracy itself, such as humanity, uh, justice, and and uh, equality. That actually uh, are the foundations of of our law making, making instead of just what's stated in the laws. Thank you so much for reminding us, uh, Masalamba. So well, we are getting close to uh, to the, the end of our event. So I'm going to ask each panelist uh, to give us a closing statement. Mostly, if 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 I can request is. Where do we go from here? What do we need to do? What do what step do we need to take? Uh, what action do we really need to consider uh, in order to build our cybersecurity and our uh, cyber resilience, especially in terms of voicing out and being uh, the the uh, the forerunners of 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 the decent voices uh, and trying to get into the uh, public uh, public participation in especially in the lawmaking process. Uh, can I start with uh, Mashirli? Okay. Uh, so please allow me to answer that question to draw the attention of audience to 
uh, ongoing research that I'm doing with TIFA Foundation. So it, this research is about the comparison of data protection regulation or bill in Indonesia with the European standard that is Convention 108 plus and uh, the general data protection regulation. So we discussed with the communication ministry just yesterday and we found out there are challenges like for example, there is a principle of proportionality. How do we measure, how do we materialize being proportionate when we collect data, personal data? So it is not an easy answer. So based on our discussion just yesterday, so my takeaway lesson is that I want to quote a highly uh, respected uh, scholar in Indonesia, that is uh, Dr. Yan Wanugroho, that is we need to criticize the government as sharp as possible, but we also need to help them as much as we could. That's my takeaway lesson. Thank you, Ms. Shirley. Rafio? Okay, uh, because I'm speaking here as a victim, not a, as a researcher or something, so I'm going to be a bit less scholarly than uh, what Shirley showcased earlier. So what I want to say is that, um, just quickly, uh, People kept telling me for the past six months that nothing happened to me because I got out of it scotch-free. I didn't get, uh, I wasn't named a suspect. I didn't get beaten up. I wasn't harmed uh, physically. But what I want people to know is that the effects of one single incident that April 22nd has been massive in, on my life. It has affected my work. It has affected my family. It has affected my personal life. It has affect, It will probably continue to affect me for years to come. And people need to understand that our law enforcement, our legal infrastructure, our law enforcement are not ready yet. And I think while I'm speaking as a victim, I also work in advocacy and I do, I do believe that we have a way to, you know, come to a, Come to a to come to a condition where uh, the government the, the 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 government's interest doesn't contradict the public interest, uh, but it starts with the government at least. Uh, so I'm speaking to anyone from the government who is probably watching this. Hopefully, that it's it needs to start with the government acknowledging that there is a problem to begin with. Otherwise, there's no way we can come up to a solution. Uh, I just like people to know that people who told me that. If I wasn't guilty, then why don't why don't I make any reports? Why don't I try to get justice? I'm just going to tell you this uh, and end it. I've made reports to the witness and uh, victim protection agency, the LPS, the LPSK. I've made a report to the ombudsman, to the human rights commission, to the police internal affairs, to the police cyber crime uh, division, to the police national commission, the Compolnas, and also I've went through a pre-trial court, and none of them have given me any closure. So the question is not that is the government uh, not protecting us, it's that is the institution able and ready to address the new problems, the, 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 compli the complicated issues that cybersecurity and cyber resilience uh, come, come with. So that will be my last take on it. Thank you, Rafael. Masapto? Yeah. Can you give us your closing statement, please? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Anita. I think now in Indonesia, politics and oligarchs is feel the strap about uh, the CSO. Uh, CSOs must emphasize uh, to the government the need to respect to civil society. We have the same concern for the progress of the country but respect others' parties and don't master of the truth and think that the only way is the most correct. I think it's enough for the maybe government and uh, who's the responsibility about the country. Thank you, Nit. Thank you, Mas Sabto. Ah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so I will, I will talk with the context of uh, region, uh, ASEAN. So digital rights will be here, uh, is here, actually are already here and will stay a little uh, longer. And uh, ready or not, uh, whether we are ready in terms of uh, legal framework on others, uh, we have to respond to that, uh, especially uh, civil society. 
and um, putting human rights into digital or digital into human rights, it requires accountability from the state and state obligation uh, into, uh, to ensure that everyone has right to access to digital media, right to access to uh, digital space, and more importantly, that everyone should be feel uh, safe while in digital space. Thank you. Thank you, Mbak Yuyun. Melissa, can we have your last uh, closing statement? Yeah, I agree entirely with what Yunyun just said. Um, I think that it's really important if you take Indonesia is um, the only G20 in the ASEAN, and there is a very important role that Indonesia has to play not only in the region, but among the G20 partners. And when you think of this important role, it's important also to make sure that we have informed and prepared leaders for how we're going to move in the digital space. I think that first requires an overall strategic vision for the next five to 10 years for Indonesia, not only in the ASEAN, but in, for the, within the G20. I think second, it requires a broad awareness and education campaign, not only of the government officials, but of society of how do we work and um, online, how do we stay safe online, how important this access is and in order to have that, um, the available technology and working with that technology to advance society. I think third, that we have to update the laws for the digital world. And currently they're not, um, they're not updated anywhere around the world, including here in the United States. And that requires again, um, advancing and understanding where do we want to be five to 10 years from now as we continue to digitize and become more dependent on these things. Having that strategy and, and enabling that leadership and holding our leaders accountable, both in the government and industry will help advance society going forward. Again, thank you for allowing me to participate this evening. Thank you, Melissa. And last but not least, of course, Mas Herlambang. Yeah, uh, we are now facing or entering uh, uncertain and difficult situations in the country, as you have known in the streets, many protesters now is going to the palace. Uh, there are two issues that I would like to end. First, uh, for civil society, of course, we need to equip ourselves by standard for self-protection, ensuring uh, office security, perform uh, classification uh, regarding to the information, and also ensuring the network security and defense safety. And uh, of course, making alliance in order to monitor the policy reform uh, and advocacy. For the government, uh, this is uh, uh, need to be uh, making sort of like a stronger attention to the importance of uh, cybersecurity. Uh, start from the HCS base for, for instance, like uh, addressing buzzer or even also state funded influencers uh, should, be end, uh, should, should be ended because uh, a spokesperson, uh, the the best spokesperson saying that uh, the frontliner of democracy is uh, influencer. Of course, I, I would uh, not agree with this kind of <laughs> uh, statement because uh, this is not promoting human rights. Uh, by uh, uh, Actually, we need to uh, bring in the message of meaningful uh, public participations. And uh, state should fight uh, or to end digital attacks because first, uh, this is uh, duping or pembodohan. Second is damaging for democracy and rule of law. And the third one, of course, uh, violating digital rights as human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Mas Lambang. So uh, I think we come to the end of the session and the discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists for the inspiring and excellent and all so brilliant discussions and insights and thoughts that you've shared with us today. Um, I think uh, if I can just summarize a little bit from what uh, we have discussed, well, in terms of cyber attacks and also uh, building cyber um, cyber security and cyber resiliency, this is not only a matter of, of problems that we face in Indonesia. It's also something that we face regionally, globally, and every country now is trying to find an answer to that and no one blueprint that is already set that can ensure that it will be effective for all, for every country. So we still have to find a way for ourselves to uh, to um, 
to, for, to find the formulation what works best for us in order to protect our uh, digital rights, uh, our uh, rights especially to, uh, for expression, and our rights when we are attacked uh, uh, in the cyberspace. But at the same time, we can actually use the network that we have regionally and globally to try to learn from each other to build uh, the capacity of one another and to um, actually build a, a network that will help in terms of uh, when an attack is happening, some other uh, entities from other uh, different countries might help because they have experienced that. That's something that we need to build. And at the same time, we also, we also need to work in the national level and also at the local level. We need to raise awareness because uh, as Melissa said that, and, and also the uh, uh, Shirley said that uh, we basically a lot of uh, part of the governments and the legislation uh, and the parliaments do not understand the problem, what the problem is. So it is part of our, uh, of our responsibility to get them to understand and to actually listen uh, to our voice and to actually try to come up with the law that can, uh, that can handle this problem and at the same time uh, protect our rights uh, and, and be able to, um, uh, to serve democracy the way it should be. And I know that Ravio is having uh, a little bit of uh, uh, distrust, although not all, uh, to the law enforcement, but I think we also need to be able to find people like uh, allies that we can find uh, in the government, in the law enforcement, or in the civilian organizations to come up and try to build this alliance together so that we will be very strong. Uh, we have cyber security at place and our cyber resilience will go up and, and we can handle and bounce back every time we have an attack. So I think uh, that's all for me. And, all, and thank you so much again for all panelists. Thank you so much for all the participants who's been uh, listening and watching and participating as well. I'm going to turn this back um, to our uh, Master of Ceremony, Rifda. Thank you. Thank you, Ma Anita, for wrapping up the discussion and for the thought-provoking questions. And thank you for all speakers for the insightful and very comprehensive discussion. And of course, thank you for everyone, for all participants who have stayed until the end and actively engaged with our discussion tonight. So the next um, session, I would like to allow the organiz organizers to hand the certificates for our speakers today. So we're trying to um, do it virtually. <laughs> and I'd like to call um, first the first certificate. Maybe the host can show the certificate in the screen. And I'd, the first certificate for Ms. Shirley Haristia will be uh, virtually handed by Forum Asia by Mbak Rahel Arini. Please, Mbak Rahel Arini. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of Forum Asia and other organizers, we would like to say thank you so much, Mbak Sarli, for sharing your insight. Um, so here uh, we present the uh, online certificates for you. Hopefully we can follow up after this. Thank you. Thank you, my pleasure to share. Thank you, Mbara Hel. And can the next one um, for the certificate for Mas Rafio, as appears in the screen, maybe the host can um, can help uh, show the, the certificate, will be handed virtually by Nurina Safitri from Amnesty International Indonesia. Please, Ma Nurina. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rafio, for joining us in this webinar. A uh, very insightful discussion tonight, and I hope everyone uh, will get a lot of things from our discussion today. Thank you, and this is the certificate from us. You're welcome, anytime. Manurina. Our pleasure. Thank you. Okay, for the next one, um, the certificate for uh, Masato Anguro. Uh, probably the host can show it in the screen. It'll be virtually handed by 
Mbak Dewi Sari from Mavindo. Please, Mbak Dewi. Thank you, Mbak Rivia. And thank you for uh, Mr. Sabto Anggoro for your enlightening discussion at this moment. And we present the certificate for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dewi. Welcome. Okay, thank you. And for um, the next one, the certificate for Ms. Yuyun, Wayuning Room. Can uh, the host show it in the screen? It'll be virtually handed by SafeNet, Nika Andaru. Silahkan. Uh, hello, um, Bayu Yun. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation and talks and uh, your time uh, to join us in this webinar. So uh, on behalf of SafeNet and other organizer, uh, we, will, we would like uh, to present this uh, certificate for you. Thank you so much. Bye, Yuyun. Pleasure. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, move on to the next speaker. Um, this is the certificate for Ms. Melissa Hathaway. Um, maybe the host can show the certificate in the screen. And this certificate will be virtually handed by Mas Ardi Suteja from ICSF. Please, Mas Ardi. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the organizer, I'd like to present you with a token of appreciation from all of us uh, to Melissa. And it was a very indeed a, a great presentation and hopefully that we can all learn from each other and uh, we look forward to uh, another session in the next future. Thank you. Thank you, Ardi. I look forward to coming to Indonesia and meeting everybody in person and hopefully that will happen sooner then later. So thank you again this evening. It's a great honor to participate with you. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa and Mas Ardi. And for the next certificate for Mas Herlambang, Wirat Raman, uh, it will be virtually handed by Hari Sufehmi from Mafindo. Silakan, Mas Hari. Hari is not attending in. Oh, oke. Okay. Uh, kalau gitu bisa Mbak Dewi mewakili mungkin dari Mafindo. Oke. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Herlambang Pewira Draman for your enlightening discussion today. And uh, I'm so glad to give the certificate uh, presenting to you. Thank you again. Terima kasih semuanya. Uh, senang bisa gabung di sini. Thank you. And last but not least, for uh, the certificate for our amazing moderator, Mbak Anita Wahid, maybe uh, oh, the what? host can show it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't expect and that. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be uh, especially handed virtually by our own SafeNet, Damar Juniarto. Silakan Mas Damar. Thank you, Anita, for delivering uh, such a great uh, moderating uh, for this uh, national webinar. On behalf of SafeNet and other organizers, uh, I handed you this certificate. Thank you so much, Damar. Uh, I'm just so glad that I can um, contribute to something here. And hopefully, we, this is just the first of many, many discussions that we have. And there will be so many steps that we can take together to actually for the benefit of all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And also for those attending now who would like to receive a certificate, please send a request to uh, email address kakdam at protonmail.com. So once again, kakdam at protonmail.com. And um, we're... We have arrived at, at the end of our um, event and we're going to have a photo session. And please everyone um, turn on your camera and put on your best smiles <laughs> for everyone to see. And the host will help us to take screenshots and probably hold it for a couple of seconds because we have a lot of attendance uh, tonight and then we're going to hold for the host to take pictures of 
all of us. So maybe the host can um, give us some uh, counting. Okay, uh, I'll count uh, down three, two, one, and please hold until five seconds, I guess, because we have five page in here. So I need to capture all of you guys. <laughs> okay, so I will start uh, from now. Three, two, one. Okay, this is for first page. Uh, okay, wait. <laughs> it's okay for the second page. One, two, three. Thank you so much. And then uh, wait. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry. It's quite <laughs> handful here. Okay, and then for the third page. Okay, one, two, three. Thank you so much. And then the next page. One, two, three. Okay, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank and you. if you Thank if you like the everyone. material of the presentation, you can uh, request also. It'll be given by request. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Steve. you, everyone. Don't forget to follow and subscribe SafeNet channel and media social.